All right, welcome to this video. I want to show how we can take some recursive code that we may have written and turn it into a recurrence relation that expresses the runtime of that recursive code. Now I've designed some recursive code here using a pretty standard divide and conquer strategy, um, but this code doesn't really do anything. And that's because I wanted some code that is generic enough that you could probably make your code look like this code in some way. So uh, what I'm going to do here is I'm just going to point out some of the pieces of the code I've got. First of all, we've got our terminating case up here, or maybe I'll start out with my input. I've decided I've got my, my generic code here is going to take a list. A lot of code might take a list. Maybe yours doesn't take a list. Think of how you might be able to map it in. The main reason why I wanted this list is it's going to have an input size of size n. Instead of just taking n as input, I wanted something that had more structure to it because usually that's the case in a problem that we might be solving. So my input's going to be of size n, it's going to be a list, and I'm just going to have my terminating condition here be whenever the list is maybe empty or of size 1, I'll just return the list back out. So that's sort of the standard, say that that's a solution in a, in a sorting example, we just return the list out in those cases, maybe that will be the case here as well. However, otherwise, I want us to think about what we're going to be doing in the recursive case. So down here, this was our, our up here was our terminating cases, our recursive case, whenever n is greater than 1. And I put a couple different method calls in here. First of all, maybe we need to do something to our data. Okay, I've said here, I've got this method do something. And at the moment, I said that's taking us a constant time. What does that maybe mean? Maybe calculating where the midpoint of our data is or maybe calculating some other feature that also just takes constant time. Now at the moment I'm going to say that these extra functions I've got here are all taking constant time but in a second I'm going to change that and see how that's going to affect things. Then maybe what I need to do is grab some components for the moment, I've assumed that I need two, and that's something I'm going to talk about here in a second. But say I need to extract one half, I'll call it maybe A1, and A2 be the other half. I haven't really said halves here, but I'm just using as an example, where I have this subroutine that does that. Now, how long does that take? I'm saying that takes us constant time too, okay, at least for this example. Now we've got some recursive calls. That's the calls to this function here. That's, that's what we're trying to figure out, how long they take, how long this whole method takes. But after the recursive calls, so maybe we recurse once on A1 and we recurse once on A2, giving us some results, B1 and B2, and we need to put those back together. Again, maybe using some method, I've called this one rebuild. I'm going to say, again, it's going to take constant time. And then we would just return whatever it is that we've rebuilt. Now that's the structure of the code. You can maybe look at your code and say, hey, my code kind of looks like that. What kind of differences might your code have? Well, you might be missing some of these parts. That's fine. I've tried to put in all the parts, like maybe you do extracting, but you don't need to do any rebuilding or vice versa. Maybe you don't do any extracting. It's already pretty much extracted, but you do have to rebuild it after you do recursion. In that case, you're, you know, leave them as these theta ones here. Theta one means constant time, but basically we could, we could sub that in for any zero time. If you have something missing here, we could say, okay, that's constant time spent doing these activities. In fact, that constant is zero. And then again, maybe you don't have any prep work to do, but maybe you have all these, maybe there's one other thing I could put here. Maybe there's some after work we need to do as well. Uh, I didn't add that, but if yours has that, well, think maybe there's do something too that goes down below, okay? Uh, or maybe that's just part of your rebuild function. I'm not sure, okay? Whatever it is, what other ways might yours differ is this too. And I, I, again, I mentioned I'm going to come back to that. Maybe you only do this once. You only extract one thing, recurse once, and then rebuild. Or maybe it's more than two. Maybe it's three or four or five or, and, and so on. In which case, that's another feature here that at least for the moment I've left as a, a concept too. What we really want to do now is assume, okay, assume you're on board with me. We've got this structure here. We've got constant time for all those parts, but we still want to know how much time this is going to take. We need a recurrence relation here, T of n, that's going to help us express the runtime for this particular code. So let's take a quick look and remember that our T of n, our recurrence relation is going to have uh, four parts and I'm going to start on the right hand side because these just tell us the conditions. The first one is going to be about our terminating condition and so I'm just going to go look up here and see okay gee this says the terminating condition is when n is less than or equal to 1 and then that means 
that my recursive case must be the other cases when n is greater than 1. Now, typically we're only going to have these uh, four parts or these two cases with their uh, four parts, but you might actually have a different kind of code that maybe has more than one base case or more than one recursive case, and you might end up with more cases here. That's fine too. I'm just going to show you how to do uh, the simple case first, and then you can generalize on that for a more complicated case. Now, uh, the next step I'm going to do is the terminating case. We need to figure out how many uh, operations it takes when we're in the terminating case. Now, um, I've done this a number of times before, so without even thinking about it, I'm just going to write a C there. And the reason is, when we're in the terminating case, we know the input size n is going to be small. Um, and specifically, less than some specific fixed value. In this case, it happens to be 1. It's so small, it's either 0 or 1. In which case, we know that any amount of work we're going to be doing here is going to be a constant amount of work. And we can verify that right now. Let's just go see how much work is being done. Well, we enter the function, then we do one comparison here to see if n is in this range, and then we do a return. What's that? One, two, maybe three operations. I'm calling it c since I don't really care what that number is going to be, but certainly it's going to be a constant. Okay, so again, usually no matter what your recursive code is, how do we get to the terminating case? We enter the method, we notice we're in the terminating case, and then we're usually done. And that usually takes us a constant amount of time. Okay, so uh, I often am just by reflex filling this in with a C now, um, but now let's look at the next part. Now the next part, I usually break into two. So I'm gonna write out a general term here. We're gonna have something that looks like this, maybe A, times t of some function of n, I'm just going to put n in there for a moment, but that, that's usually not well defined, plus something else here, and maybe I'll just put a question mark here for now, okay? Um, and what this is, is we've got, uh, at least the way I've structured it right now, we've got this term here, we've got two terms, and the first term here is the term that tells us how much uh, recursive work is being done. And then I usually just call this the extra work, um, but this is the iterative work. And by iterative, I mean basically just not recursive. Iterative mean maybe it's a loop or we just call one of these other functions, okay? And that's exactly what's gonna fill in there is those other functions. And it may be at this point, because that's gonna be the easier one, I'm gonna fill in that one first, this question mark. What is the extra work being done? The extra work is anything except the recursive calls. So I'm going to sort of, let's just box off these recursive calls here and, and say everything else, how much work do we do? So let's just go through and quickly verify. We come in, we check here, and we're not in this case. So we, we might have to do this check, and this might be an else. Well, one way or another, we are only doing a constant work to get to here. Then we call this function, okay? It's a constant. Then we call these two functions. They're constants as well. Then we do some recursion, but that's what this term is about, so we're going to ignore it for now. And then we call rebuild, but we said that's a constant too. And then we return, and that's a constant too. So really what we've got here is a, con a bunch of constants. How many of them a constant number? So I'm just going to call it D for now. So that brings us now to the recursive bit. We need to figure out the recursive bit. And let's look here. This A, this A here, is going to tell us how many recursive calls we're making. So usually that's as simple as looking over here and seeing, oh, there's two of them. And then this bit in here where this n is, this n is technically uh, wrong, remember, because if we take uh, t of n and we de define it in terms of t of n, that's reflexive. We've, we've said, you know, a is equal to a. That doesn't really tell us what a is. It's also something we already know. And in fact, if, if we set it up something like this, t of n is equal to 2 t of n, that's going to set up something impossible mathematically. So we need to change n in here. We need to try, and the, the uh, rule of thumb for recursion is it needs to get smaller, smaller and smaller and smaller, so that we eventually get down to the terminating case. So we want to see what are the size of a1 and a2. Now here, in this code that I've written here, I haven't told you what extract does because I wanted to leave it a little bit general. Well, I, I sort of mentioned as I was talking, I said maybe what it does is it pulls out half of A, okay? Let's assume here going forward that that's what it does. It actually gets half of A, all right? If it does get half of A, then we'll write N over two. 
The other possibility here, in some of our code, we're gonna get n over two, but in other times, we'll get this n minus one. We might get an n minus one term in there, or something altogether different. We don't always divide by two. We could get n over you know three or four or some other values, okay? So there's many ways that we could get this. So at this point, the inside here, this is the size of your recursive call. And I, and I guess I should reiterate, this one is the number of recursive calls, okay? So you're looking to see how many recursive calls, that's the coefficient out front, how big is he, are they? That's the size that we write inside here, okay? Now, some of you might be thinking, but wait a second, the code that I wrote I do make two calls, but one is bigger than the other. Okay, well then you're gonna to have to split this term into two terms, okay? This only works if all the calls are the same size. If they're all the same size, you can lump them all together and say I did two of them, four of them, 10 of them, however they are, how many there are. But sometimes, let's just think of an, another example here. In Fibonacci, we might have t of n minus one plus t of n minus two, and we just have to leave it like this, okay? Because these are different terms. We can't, we can't uh, bundle them together. Okay, uh, so that's how we put this together. And now, uh, one thing I wanna do is, and this is just a quick aside, if you haven't watched the uh, Master Theorem video yet, then that's okay. But this T of N, the one that I've got here, um, actually looks very closely like um, some other ones we may have looked at before, and we can run this through the master theorem. We're going to have to do log base 2 of 2 is going to be 1, okay? And that's bigger than this. Uh, this there's a secret little n to the 0 out, out on the side here. Um, that's just a 1, right? And so this is going to be the dominant term. So this is actually uh, theta of n, the one that we've looked at here. Let's see, let's see what happens now if we made some changes. Okay, let's see what happens if we change. I'm gonna do one in here that I think is kind of interesting. If we change this n minus one, maybe our extraction here didn't pump out these n over twos, they pumped out n minus ones. If we did that, we'd get a new t of n, and that new t of n would be exponential. Okay, let's take a half of a second to step back to see why that would be. Well, what did we change in our recurrence relation? We changed the n over two. We used to divide it in two every time, okay? So think about it, say we started with uh, 16, right? The next time down, we would have eight. And then the next time down, we would have four and so on, okay? So we see we're, we're having every time we go down. And then what the two out front is telling us is that we're doubling every level we go down. Well, how many levels do we end up going down? Log n, we double that many times we get to n. That's what we had up here. But when we change it to n minus one, now what happens? We have 16, we go down to 15. Then we go down to 14. And every time we go down, we double the size, double the size, double the size. So we actually end up going down 16 levels, right? and getting to 2 to the 16th, which is about 65,000, 65,536, which is way bigger than the 16 that we would have got in our previous one. So changing this n over 2 to an n minus 1 actually usually makes things pretty bad for us. And that's why you're going to see that in a lot of our divide and conquer, we end up dividing the size. So now let's try it and go the other way. Let's say what happens is, the size extract pulled out n over 4 instead of n over 2. What do we get in this case? Again, quick application of the uh, master theorem. If you're not familiar with it, go check out that video. Uh, will give us root of n. And why is that? That's because log base 4 of 2, log base 4 of 2 is square root. And that's, uh, or, or it's one half, I should say, which gives us the square root uh, function here. So uh, changing this, making this smaller, the size smaller, actually reduced our runtime from n to square root n. That's interesting. Okay. Now, another technique we can use here is, well, let's, let's change things up a little bit here. Um, let's change this to, to a 4. If we change it to a four, now these two match. And again, those familiar with the master theorem means we're back at theta of n now that those match again, okay? 
So now imagine we're doing four. What, first of all, what happened when we changed it to four? Remember, that's the number. That's how many recursive calls. So now imagine we had A1, A2, A3, A4. And then we did recursive call on A1, recursive call on A2, recursive call on A3, recursive call on A4. That would be four recursive calls. And maybe they were each of size one quarter. If that were the case, we're back to big theta of n. Okay. But now we can see what, what happens if we change the size again, if we made this smaller, we would get we would make our exponent bigger. So what's the possibility here? I'm going to try one out. If we put a two in there, we now get log base two of four is two or n squared would be our runtime. So that would give us theta of n squared. Let's say we put an eight in there. This one's getting a little bit trickier now, uh, especially if you're trying to do master theorem in your head like I am. Now we need to know what log base eight of four is. And that one's a little bit curious. Uh, luckily I've calculated before, so I actually know what it is. It's three halves. And so I, I just, I reciprocaled it. I said I calculated for four and I knew it. In fact, then I flipped it around. To get from eight to four, we actually need two thirds, not three halves. So I apologize for that. Three halves is the other way around from four to eight. Um, but if we take eight and we raise it, so, so let's, let, let's calculate that one together. If you don't believe me, I said eight to the two thirds is equal to four. How would we even know that? I don't even know how to raise something to the two thirds. Well, eight to the one third, that's just a, a weird way of saying the cube root of eight. So we could write eight to the two thirds as this, eight to the one third squared. Well, the cube root of eight, we know what that is. That's two. So this is two squared and two squared is four. Hey, so that's what we wanted. So eight to the two thirds is indeed equal to four. Okay, so what that would mean is if we changed it to this, this structure now, where maybe we were dividing our input array into eight, but we're only recursing on four of those eights, then we would end up with this interesting n to the two thirds as our runtime. Okay, that's probably enough here. I'm going to change these two back to twos, mostly because twos are the most common thing you're going to find here, at least in, in this bit, dividing by two, since we tend to do things like binary search, we in merge sort does it the same way. We like to divide things in two. Um, that, that's our, our nature in computer science. And this out front can change, okay? Uh, Karatsubas does a change on this. Strassens does a change on this. We still divide everything by two in those algorithms, but in one of them we have three out front, another we have seven out front, and so on. Some of our, our uh, grade school algorithms have a four out front or an eight out front. So all of these things are pretty common, uh, even based on what we've used. But now what I want to see is what happens if we change the amount of extra work we do. Now let's go back and look and see what do you mean extra work? Well, we have these extra functions, do something, extract, rebuild, do something, extract, rebuild. Now, not all of the methods that we are, all of the recursive functions we have out there are going to have all these components. Let's think of a couple examples that we have right away. Okay, I'm going to pick up three um, functions, or re three recursive algorithms, um, binary search, merge sort, and quick sort, and think about what they do. Okay, so binary search, what we have to do is we have, we definitely have a do something. In binary search, the do something is finding the middle point, the point that we need to check. Okay, and usually that is a little bit of math. And in binary search, that matters, right? We need to do an A plus B and then divide by two, maybe take the floor, do something in there. And there's a little bit of arithmetic in there. It's a constant amount, but that's all that matters. So binary search has to do something, but it doesn't necessarily have an extract. I guess you could think it does. The extract is just looking at that element. Um, but then it does have a recurse, recurse on the lower half or recurse on the upper half. And that part is, is important. Um, that part it depends on where you want to put it in the extractor, the recurse, we have to figure out what component we're actually looking at. So, so maybe the extract function, the best way to think of binary search, the extract function is calculating, we have to move one of those endpoints, you know, maybe the A or the B the the front or the or the end, we have to move it in a little bit more. That's what our extract is doing here. But again, that's constant time. 
okay? Recurse, we only actually have one of these recurses in binary search. And then same thing, rebuild, do we have a rebuild? No, we usually just return back exactly what we recursed on, returned us. So there's actually no rebuild in binary search. So we might say that this one we could just cross off, but counting it as constant time is fine. Okay, so if anything doesn't exist, we should count it as constant time. What about merge sort? Merge sort, what do we do? We do, at the beginning, we don't really need to do much. We often do, but we don't need to. What's the first step of merge sort is just split the list into two arbitrarily. It doesn't matter how you do it. So uh, a common way we think of doing it when we describe it is saying take the first half and then take the second half and, and then recurse on each half. That's visually helpful because we can draw a circle around the first half and a circle around the second half. But programmatically, a very common way that we do it is we take the evens and the odds. And that's because it can be easier to write a little bit of code that says throw the evens in one list, throw the odds in the other list, and then recurse on them. Okay. Now that depends on how you're trying to implement it, but there's more than one way to do it. And so what the, the point that I'm trying to get to here is that this part is usually arbitrary and it comes up to how you do it with your implementation in merge sort. So it might exist or it might not exist depending on what sort of implementation style you've got. But again, if it does exist, let's think about that. If we're going through the whole list, and we're saying odd ones go in this pile, even ones go in this pile, or first ones go in this pile, uh, second ones go in this pile. If we're actually iterating over those lists in some way, we've changed these to ends. Okay. And maybe this is a point where I'll, I'll just pause and say it doesn't matter which one of these we've changed to an end, it's going to create an end down here, right? If one of these is end and the rest are ones, it doesn't matter that the rest are ones, the, the end will be the dominant term. So we'll get an end down here. Okay. Now it turns out that merge sort, so extracting might take us time, but if you're clever, maybe it doesn't. But in merge sort, we do have to put things back together. After recursing, we have these two sorted lists, but we need to stick them together into one sorted list. And the only way to do that is to call that merge subroutine. So specifically here, rebuild and merge sort is the merge subroutine. And we know that one is, is n. Okay, I said the other one I might look at is quick sort. The only thing I wanted to say about quick sort is quick sort, we do have to extract them. Remember, that's that pivot operation right? Where we say, are you less than or greater than this pivot? If so, if you're less than, go in this pile. If you're greater than, go in this pile. Um, that extraction op operation is necessary and it's going to be uh, n, but we have no rebuild in quicksort necessarily. We it, Again, it depends a little bit on how you've done it, but in, in the rebuild, once you've recursed the two parts, you can just sort of glue them back together. So if all you need to do is some pointer math there to have one the end of one list point to the beginning of the next list, that's constant time. So that's why I'm saying if you're clever, you might not need the rebuild, but that same comment I made on the merge sort comes back here. If any of these happen to be uh, uh, n. If any of these helper functions are n, we're going to get an n down here. Or if any of them are n and all the rest are less than n, then we will get an n down here. Okay. So what happens when we change this to n? Again, I, I'm not going to do the, the, necessarily the math there, but using uh, master theorem, this will give us an n log n, which maybe is not too surprising because that is merge sort and roughly quick sort or quick sort in the best uh, case will get us this n log n runtime. And that's what comes out. Now, what did we do here? We had the same recursive structure. We split it in half, but we do two calls every time. But now we have uh, a linear amount of extra work we do on the side. Okay. So when we only had a constant amount of extra work on the side, it was theta n. But when we bump this up to doing a linear amount of extra work, we got that extra log n term on here. Here's sort of what's maybe interesting. I talked about binary search. So maybe I'll go back to binary search. Binary search has a one out front there. And binary search does not have a linear amount of work that we do. It just has a constant amount. So we know binary search is log n. But what happens if we do add that extra linear amount of work back in here? 
Well, again, a quick sort of uh, master theorem, uh, log base two of one is zero. So on this side, we got constants, but on this side, we get n. n is the dominant one, we're back at n again. Okay, so again, I'm just trying to build up our intuition of what happens when we change our recursive function. Okay, now the last change that I'm gonna maybe make here, because it's the last one that sort of makes things interesting, is say somewhere along here, actually, I'm gonna do, do this. I'm gonna say maybe, whatever this function is that we're doing, maybe the first thing we do is we sort the list. And for the moment, I'm gonna say, let's say we sort it naively. So we sort it naively, meaning uh, that takes us n squared times, and by naively, I mean employing, say, like bubble sort or selection sort. So we go ahead and do that. Again, just like we've seen uh, in the last example, if we change this one to n squared, and the other ones are less than n squared, then that means this term changes to n squared. Okay, and so when we do that, again, uh, we bounce out of the n log n and we're actually into theta of n squared now. This term becomes so dominant that this operation, the first thing we do is so, it takes so much time that all the recursive work we do afterwards is less than this whole first call. Okay, this whole first method. And that's fine too. Um, that, that's possible and common in a lot of our recursive methods as well. It just means this extra work becomes the dominant term. Okay, and that means we're going to end up landing in, I think it's the third case of the master theorem now instead of the first two cases which we saw in our previous examples. Okay, so this last case is what happens if we did this sorting. Now, maybe the last lesson or takeaway I'll, I'll add here is if this was the last thing we did is we realize oh sorting messed things up when we weren't sorting it beforehand we were in this n uh, space or maybe n log n space but now when I put in uh, sorting I'm up to n squared oh that's too bad maybe we've got mil our n's a million so n squared is really bad for us how can we change it well remember I said we were sorting here naively right Naively, meaning we use bubble sort. What if we said, okay, go ahead and use merge sort here? Well, if we use merge sort here, we end up getting dn log n here. Now, when we get to this state, if we want to do uh, our master theorem on it, it's tricky. Okay, in fact, master theorem is not going to apply on this particular one, but we will be able to improve our this now we've got a real tricky recurrence relation you might want to go use one of our other techniques now uh recursion trees uh maybe use some induction to try and improve an upper and lower bound on this um, but this one will improve from our n squared running time so if you get stuck in this case where you say hey i've i've uh i've increased my extra work so much that it has dwindled my um my whole running time it's made my whole running time worse then you just go back and think are there better ways that I can do that extra work, whatever it might be. In this case, we were talking about sorting uh, in a more efficient way so I can get that term down, okay? All right, so this was just meant to explore recursive functions and how to come up with recurrence relations based on them. So I hope this was a help. So thanks a lot for watching and we'll see you in that next video.